And so today our um, guest lecture is delivered by the first clinic. We have several presenters today. The title of the presentation is Family Intervention Response to Stop Trauma. And it's really an innovative program to address um, the trauma associated with separations due to foster care and that the needs really addressing the needs of families who find themselves under investigation by um, Child Protective Services. So I will just briefly mention the names and they may do a further deeper introduction, but we have Talia Aya, and I do not know if I said that correctly, so please correct me if I'm wrong. She is the um, uh, lawyer and the director. Adam Fallout, Gina Wassmiller, parent ally, Neil Weiss, um, attorney, and Jennifer Justice, parent ally. And so with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and turn it over to Talia. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being here and thank you for having us. Uh, my name is Tyla I, I and I am um, an attorney and the executive director for the First Legal Clinic. It's Adam Balut. I'm one of the attorneys of the First Legal Clinic. I've been a public defender uh, since 2007 and uh, I will pass it over to Neil Weiss. I'm uh, Neil Weiss. I'm also one of the attorneys for the First Legal Clinic, and I'll give it over to Gina. Good morning, everyone. I'm Gina Wassimiller, and I am a parent ally with the First Legal Clinic, and I have been mentoring parents uh, with from where I come from in child welfare and addiction and DV since 2010. And I'll turn it over to Jennifer. Hi, guys. I'm Jennifer Justice. I am a First Clinic graduate. And uh, now I have the privilege and honor of being a parent ally for the last almost two years with the clinic. Thank you, guys. I think if you, Tyler, if you can just go into explaining what the legal clinic is briefly, and then I could go into it while I'm setting that up. I think that would be good. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so first legal clinic, it stands for uh, family intervention response to stop trauma. And the trauma is the unnecessary removal of a newborn child from its birth parents. And so um, Adam, Neil, and myself are all public defenders. We represent parents who are involved in the child welfare system. And typically, um, that means representing parents when they're involved in court, um, usually after their children have been removed. And it was through this work and um, what we saw um, as attorneys that uh, the clinic was born. And then, so I'm going to go here and uh, I'm just going to briefly, I'm going to put this on, but I'm going to take it right off um, and come back because I want to kind of speak with everybody. So Tyler explained what FIRST is. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about how FIRST came into existence. And I think this is important from the perspective of understanding why. And I think when you're involved in any project, understanding your why and why you're doing something um, is very important for you. And so um, I know a lot of you said you're very familiar with child welfare. So some of you, this might be very familiar experience and for others, I know less familiar, so it might not be so. Um, uh, familiar for you, but whether you're very familiar or not familiar at all, um, the problems that I'm about to explain and why we started this aren't unique at all. And so in Washington state, obviously we're attorneys, so uh, we're licensed in Washington state and don't practice outside of our state. Um, but in Washington state, when a dependency case is filed, uh, which is the state, uh, CPS, DCYF, the department, child welfare agency, all kind of interchangeable names, when they're asking to remove a child, whether it's an infant or an older child from the parent's care, they're filing a case that they call a dependency case. And the hearing or one of the first hearings that they have, if they're asking for removal of that child is what we call a 72 hour shelter care hearing. The idea being that a parent and a family and children have the right to have the court hear the case within 72 hours of removal to decide whether that removal either should take place at all or um, whether the need for removal has been eliminated if the removal already took place. I won't go into too much detail about that unless there's any questions. But the idea is there's two main things that the state has to prove when asking for removal. One is a threat of harm. And uh, that's very, these are all very uh, uh, kind of generic terms, keeping it sort of vague, because I'm not going to get into the legal complexities of it. 
But one is the threat of harm, and the other is a very important, which is called a reasonable effort to prevent or eliminate the need for removal. The idea being that the uh, law says the state shouldn't be able to remove children unless before asking to remove, they tried to help eliminate that need for removal in the first place. So as Tyler said, Adam and myself have been um, practicing with attorneys for uh, in dependency for a while. And as we were working these cases over these years, we've seen the same case over and over and over again. And we see a petition, the petition said mom or baby or both of them tested positive for drugs at the hospital. And that was it. That was all it said. We get a petition that was uh, a page and a half long. And that was only thing it said. And this happened just a few days ago. And as uh, myself and I know my coworkers began to do more and more of these cases, I started to contest that idea that there was reasonable efforts provided. Um, because like I said, these, these petitions were a page and a half long and we would see literally nothing was done. And so when I did that, the state's response was a couple of things. One is, is they'd say, we don't need to prove reasonable efforts. With the, That's not accurate with what the law is. Or they would say, well, what could we have possibly done? The baby was born a day or two or three days ago. And what could we have reasonably done in a few days to prevent the removal? And even when we argued that, uh, the uh, court's response was to side with the state in order removal of the child. And I remember one specific hearing, I made these arguments and said, they've done literally nothing to try to help this family. And I was basically laughed at, laughed at by the court, laughed at by the state's attorney um, for even suggesting the idea that they could help these families in these situations where babies were just born a few days ago. And so... Um, things like this, over time, we started seeing over and over the same patterns and noticing the problems that led to the creation of the legal clinic. And so one of these things or one source of these was talking directly with our clients. Um, one thing that we saw is they would frequently be misinformed about the legal process and their legal rights. And one thing that they would be told often was, don't talk with CPS, don't work with them. Uh, similar to how a lot of people deal with law enforcement. Um, and... Uh, we know, just as I said, that's not necessarily the best move tactically from a legal perspective, because one of the things that needs to be proven is these reasonable efforts. Um, another thing we hear from our clients as well, you know, hey, I know my friend or my neighbor, and they're 10 times worse than I am, and they have custody of their kids, so um, I, I must be okay. And we'd also see the other end of that spectrum, too, where clients would be saying far too much and making their case much more difficult than it needed to be by saying a little bit more than they needed to. Um, we'd also talk about our clients and their experience in what they call FTDMs or family team decision meetings. These are meetings that DCYF or a child welfare agency has where they're discussing a plan, either if there's a possibility of removal or just trying to come up with a safety plan for a child um, to discuss it with the family and their supports and any professionals. And we would ask our clients what happened at these meetings when we were there or weren't there before we ever got on the cases. And the only thing that they asked, they were told, where do you want your baby to go? Do you have a relative that your baby can go with? Or do you want your baby to be in licensed foster care? Where is your baby going to go? And first notable that these meetings would take place within days after the child was born. Um, not unusual for these meetings to happen with uh, these families and parents still in the hospital, not even discharged themselves yet for their own care. Um, and then we'd ask their clients, well, what did they discuss about a plan to keep the baby with you or um, a plan for you to engage in services? And they'd say, nothing. They only asked where I wanted my baby to go. That was it. The other thing we noticed talking to our clients is that they were ready for an intervention. So one thing we'd ask our clients, I'm, I'm uh, guessing a lot of you are familiar with six months P PPW programs, uh, six month inpatient programs, we would say, if you can go to a six month inpatient program with your baby today, would you go? And uh, a lot of them would go, yes, absolutely, I would go. But when we went and talked to the DCYF, the child welfare CPS caseworker, we'd say, well, what, what, what's it going to take? They're ready to go to an inpatient facility with their baby today. They said, well, um, we might be able to get them a substance use disorder or drug and alcohol assessment in a couple of weeks. Um, and then so they would be talking about getting in that assessment with, within weeks and then literally talking about getting one of these bed dates within months. And that's what we were dealing with at these open hearings. So it would mean that these babies would be out of their mother's care, out of their parents' care for what could be months. Um, something that we've also learned that I'm sure everybody here is far more familiar with us uh, with this than us, but we've learned over this process is that 
from a, a perspective um, from brain development and chemistry that new parents and new mothers, they're changing in how they're responding to being a new mother. And that changes um, their own uh, outlook for and they, how they um, are able to interact with the world around them and that they're open to changes because they just had a child. And so part of that is the process um, that comes with becoming a new parent. And again, I know all of you here are much more familiar with that than us, but that's something we learned as we started doing this. And something our clients would say is they would say, I would do anything to keep my baby. And then when we talk about what that anything was, it was just like what I said, that anything that the state would want, that CPS would want, would take weeks, if not months to accomplish. So in addition to talking to our clients, we also would have our own experience with our clients. So for an example, we have these 72 hour shelter care hearings. Um, when we get those as attorneys, we're assigned those cases, not surprisingly, because they're supposed to take place 72 hours um, within the removal or when the case is filed, we would get them maybe a day or two if we were lucky on, uh, uh, on the, to work those cases before going into these hearings and having a fully contested hearing with testimony um, and all of those things. Uh, that's if we're lucky, we'd get a day or two of advance notice that we were assigned to the cases. But um, if we were unlucky, it would be hours. Uh, literally one time I was walking around in the courtroom and, or not the courtroom, the courthouse, and somebody came up to me and said, Neil, can you do a shelter care right now in five minutes? Um, and so not that that was frequent, but that gives you an example of what time you're given to try to represent these people in these incredibly important hearings that they literally would think it would be okay to walk up to you and try to get you assigned within minutes of that hearing happen. And so our clients, is, you know, the clients who were coming out of this, who had just given birth, um, sometimes still hadn't even been discharged from the hospital yet. Certainly wasn't unusual for them to come in with the wristband still on. Um, some of them had traumatic births, C-sections, or any other sort of traumatic event that could go on with the birth. And they're coming into these hearings. And what are they looking like at these hearings? Well, they're all terrified. And they had no idea what was going to happen. And they would all show it differently. Some of them would be completely withdrawn. And you try to talk to them and understand where to go with their case. And they wouldn't even be able to talk about it. Some of them were angry. And they would be mad at everybody around them, which would be completely understandable. Some were inconsolably upset. Can't even work with them because um, they're crying so hard and so upset with it. Also, understand, uh, also understandable. And some of them just simply wouldn't come at all, um, either because of their own past trauma, uh, especially with previous interactions with child welfare, um, or just uh, uh, the flight and flight response and them uh, fleeing because this was too scary and traumatic for them to deal with. So these are things that we experience with our clients, but we also see things as professionals, as attorneys working on these cases. Uh, one thing we'd see again in these petitions is that there was a moment for intervention that if we knew we were there, we could have changed the direction. Like I said, reasonable efforts and working with services can be a basis to not remove. And so we would see in these moments, the petition, they said, well, would you want to work with us and work with an in-home service and a uh, uh, drug and alcohol evaluation. And that's not every petition, but it was some of them. And the parent would go, no, I want to have nothing to do with you. And it was like, well, if we were there to help guide them, that wouldn't have been the result. We maybe could have avoided a removal and a filing altogether. Like I said, we're doing these hearings within no time. So even if we were trying to get a relative placement or relative supports, we'd have no time to put that in before the hearings. The first time, oftentimes we were meeting these clients was at the courthouse at these hearings. And we would say, um, well, if your baby can't be with you, where would it be good for them to go? They go, oh, well, you know, my aunt, she's around. She'd be really helpful. We go, is she coming today? She's like, no. Well, what's she doing right now? She's at work. So we wouldn't be able to get them and it would delay having the baby placed with family because we had zero time to prepare for it. It's also important to understand what CPS has role in these cases, uh, that CPS has generally a dual track role in working with children and doing the assessment of these cases. That's uh, they work on what they call administrative findings, findings for abuse and neglect, but also assessing child safety for um, uh, assessing child safety for um, uh, uh, whether they need a remove or not. But with babies, there's no abuse or neglect with newborns because before they were born, they weren't born yet to be abused and neglected. So infants who are still in the hospital never left the hospital. There's nothing to investigate for abuse or neglect. 
And so the only thing they would be doing was assessing for safety and whether there needed to be a removal. But instead of working and offering services, they would focus on investigation because they wouldn't be able to differentiate these roles. So there'd be no efforts, but really deep investigations. And then one of the worst things we saw was what we call screened out intakes. Now, this is uh, the answer to one of those questions. Uh, does CPS investigate or provide services, at least in Washington, um, for those who are pregnant? Now, uh, part of the answer is that there's prevention services, and we'll come to that, and I think Ty will discuss that later. But in general, no, because when a pregnant person is called in on the CPS, they do what's called screen that intake out. They do not investigate it because there's no child that's been abused or neglected. And so we would get these cases and we'd say, well, what could you do to help this parent? They go, well, nothing. The baby was born a few days ago. We go, yeah, he got four screened out intakes for this parent over the past few months. You were told four times that this person needed help and you did nothing to try to reach out and help them. And that would get them nowhere. So beyond that, we'd see some other things from other sources. Uh, one thing that inspired us to do this was uh, a reasonable efforts book by Judge Edwards. I mean, in that book, he said, well, mothers and babies should go to inpatient together. So, wow, we weren't crazy. Uh, a judge who was an expert on reasonable efforts was saying this should happen. Uh, we would have clients that we represented on our court appointed cases. And um, we knew when they would get pregnant on the cases we were working with them that we'd be able to get better outcomes. A lot of the clients that we worked with who got pregnant while we were working on them with a case with their older children, we'd be able to prevent the removal of their baby because we had that lead time to work with them, to come up with a plan, to get them into services. And so we had the relationship and we had the resources, um, but with the cases that were new, we didn't have that. But most impactful for us as attorneys was we would take private clients too. And so our law firm, while we're court appointed on cases and we do public defense and indigent defense, we would be able to be privately retained by um, families that had the money that had two, three, four thousand dollars $4,000 to hire us to avoid work with CPS. And we would take that money and sometimes we would have a meeting or a um, interview within hours of taking that case on. And in all of those cases, we'd be able to avoid a filing of dependency, avoid a state removal, most of the time avoid uh, uh, really in-depth CPS interaction at all. But um, oftentimes, or the worst case scenario for those cases, we'd be able to file something like a custody, uh, third party custody or guardianship for another family member to avoid the state getting involved and to keep it at least within the family. And so we could literally have a case the same day, the same exact fact, same thing with a family that had the money, that had the wealth, that had the privilege and completely avoid state involvement for that family. And then later that same day, just a few hours later, have a child that was placed into licensed foster care. And the only difference was means and wealth and privilege. And so uh, with that, uh, we began the clinic. That was the inspiration for the clinic. And in 2019, uh, we started the clinic and I'll kick it off to Adam. Thank you, Neil. So uh, we knew that we had this idea and that we needed partners. And so our first stop was our local hospital and meeting with their leadership there. Uh, one of our current board members now was their board chair at the time and got us an introduction with hospital leadership. So when we sat down with them, we brought with us um, Gina Wassamiller, our, our now parent ally for the first clinic, and talked about laying out our vision for what would this look like to have an earlier intervention where uh, families who are pregnant are connected with these resources months before the call to CBS is made. And during our pitch, the uh, hospital CEO basically interrupted us to say, you know what? we're all in, let's talk about implementation because the meeting that I just came from was for all of the children who were on suicide watch at, at our hospital. And the only thing that they have in common is that they're in foster care. So anything that we can do to get out ahead of this and to avoid this, we're all in. And so our next stop from there was the Washington chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics, uh, meeting with them, also laying out our vision and what we found with every single medical provider, every single community provider that we reached out to was uh, equally outstretched arms. Everyone was very excited about doing this. The uh, American Academy of Pediatrics, um, their executive director told us that they, are, uh, they had just come from a national conference in which the message there was, we need to start pursuing medical legal partnerships. We need to start reaching out across uh, these disciplines and creating 
uh, solutions that, that work better for families. We also met with local treatment agencies and changed up through conversation the way that these uh, evaluations are done. And previously it was done where parents had to go to the provider, sit in a waiting room, hope for a cancellation if you wanted to get in last minute. Sometimes that process would take hours, transportation barriers would be present. Uh, that got changed to just doing bedside assessments by the provider and able to get those done very quickly and streamline that process. Um, we met with our local uh, DCYF, our local child welfare agency, and initially uh, did not get a good reception there. The idea was like, this was just not going to happen. Um, and so after the clinic was up and running and they saw the success of it and they saw how these meetings were shifting and the tone of these uh, meetings were shifting and their preconceived ideas of lawyers being involved early in the process uh, didn't play out, um, we developed a partnership with DCYF. So now those screened out intakes that we mentioned earlier before, we're part of a program where those screened out intakes now come to us and we're able to do outreach, reach out to families early in the process and try to prevent these separations and removals. We also found that community resources that were out there were will, will, ready, willing, and able to partner. So this looked like uh, nurse family partnership. I saw earlier in the chat that there's uh, some people on from nurse family partnership. That's been an incredible partnership. They need people early in the process. And so connecting families early with them and then having an understanding of the providers, what the CPS process looks like as well. They want to, they want to help. These providers want to help, but they're also unwilling to step into uh, a system that they're unfamiliar with. What we, When we spoke with doctors, they said, we don't come to these family team decision-making meetings because we don't really feel comfortable in that role. We don't really feel like we should be advocates. We are doctors. That is our role. And oftentimes we feel like we have to get in there and argue. And, and so doctors were not coming to these meetings. And if doctors weren't coming to these meetings, the department was taking uh, their lack of presence or their lack of input as a big question mark. And that equaled risk for them. And so at these meetings now, doctors are able to show up, able to talk about, as was mentioned in the chat, some of the actual um, partnerships and some of the plans that the family has come up with and then present that to the department. So we're actually having better input from medical providers in a system where they initially felt very uncomfortable going into. Also, what we learned from medical providers was when they were making that mandatory report to CPS, oftentimes prenatal care was suffering and they would stop seeing families. And so there would be an actual negative impact to the families that they were helping when they were making these calls. And so anything that they could do to tell a family, look, I'm making this call. This is something that is mandatory. But at the same time, here's this clinic. Here's this resource that I want you to call and I can connect you with them right now and they will help guide you through that process. But that is separate from seeing me in your prenatal care. I want you to continue to see me. I want you to continue to come in and to actually have the benefit of this uh, care that is not traumatic and that's not unnecessarily causing issues. What we also learned is that everyone is operating in silos. Everyone is operating in silos. No one's speaking to each other. There's not a lot of collaboration that goes on. There's not a lot of opportunity for collaboration to go on. Yet there is incredibly meaningful collaboration that can occur if that opportunity is laid and that groundwork is laid. So um, we were part of a summit in, um, in 2022 in August, which brought together everyone in our state that was a stakeholder. Washington courts, the administrative office of the courts, uh, our clinic, the Washington chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics, the United Healthcare Community Plan, uh, the Healthcare Authority, DCYF, uh, the Department of Health, the Office of Public Defense, for a first ever summit to actually come together, learn from each other, but more to hear from the voice of lived experience, the voice of families that have been through this process. They have a unique voice that is able to reflect back what is actually happening in our systems and what is not happening in our systems so that we can fail, so that we can change. If the systems are failing families, those failures need to be illuminated so that they can be fixed. We had um, parents reflect back what some of uh, the most inspirational processes were and also people who, who made inspirational uh, change for them. One parent reflected on how a nurse, the kindness of a nurse, uh, made the difference. Her just going off of her shift and bringing something for her uh, stuck with her. That was like a moment of kindness that this parent will never forget. 
and to reflect back to everyone, no matter what your discipline is, whether you are a doula, a, a medical provider, a, a nurse, that your interaction with this family and with this uh, with this uh, with this patient, if it's done right and if it's done in a non-judgmental way, can make all the difference. And if we care about infant mental health and if we care about families, then caring for um, a mother or a parent who is struggling with substance use in a non-judgmental way is the best way to bridge that divide. Sometimes within the same child welfare agency, there are departments that are siloed and they don't communicate with each other. And so having the ability to bring everyone together, learn from each other, made a tremendous difference. These meetings also changed uh, tone and changed how they began processing once the power imbalance was shifted. Back in the day, before we started, it would not be uncommon for a parent to go into these meetings and have eight, 10 people from the department present, supervisors, their supervisors, uh, a social worker, social worker trainer there, and the parent would have nobody. And in this power imbalance, they were making decisions out of fear. They weren't making decisions out of being well-informed. And as Neil mentioned, there was a lot of misinformation about the process. Everyone knows that if you're driving and there's flashing lights behind you, even if you've done nothing wrong and you know you've done nothing wrong, you have to pull over, you have to participate in that process, you have to show, show your ID, you have to be civil, you have to be respectful. That understanding is not the same as it relates to child welfare and CPS. There's no flashing lights equivalent understanding for families that are dealing with this. So when CPS becomes involved, they turn to the internet, they turn to other sources, and some of those can be wildly damaging to a case, slamming the door in a social worker's face, telling him to buzz off, telling him to get a warrant, telling them that you're a sovereign citizen. All of these blueprint ideas, which online might seem like great ideas, but in practice, in reality, are not helpful to families and are not helpful to the process. So these uh, power dynamics shifted. And so in these meetings, we would actually have families and, and parents coming prepared anticipating what was happening, knowing the questions that were going on, knowing the process and being informed about what their rights were and being informed about what their options were. So um, we weren't having these broken relationships. And even at these court hearings, at these 72 hour hearings, if we technically won and the child was returned, you still had a parent who was deeply distrustful of the system and not wanting to engage with anyone. And so instead of that, we envisioned a process where we'd work with families with the idea of preventing court involvement altogether. And what we found in working with families is that a large percentage of them grew up in care. This, and, and in, in the eyes of CPS, if you grew up in care, that is a risk factor. That is not a positive. And so the cyclical pattern of you grew up in care, you had a kid, well, that child is going into foster care. And then if that child grows up, and so it's this really cyclical pattern that we sought to break and through the data, which uh, Neil will talk about a little bit later, I think we can hit on that. Um, and then I'm really loving all of the people that are here from all of the different states um, at, at this presentation. So far now, there are 38 other states that have adopted this model of prevention. And we are um, traveling around the country and helping advise other states start up their prevention efforts as well, because people are seeing the value of shifting the way that our system does business, does business and actually helping families before they're broken. I can guide and I can provide a legal uh, advocacy. I can tell parents what's coming. I can alert them of what their rights are, what other non-court uh, options and interventions there are, what other court interventions there are. But I've never gone to treatment, a parent ally has. And that is an emotional connection that is invaluable to our clinic. So when I get that initial call, um, my warm handoff is to the parent ally with lived experience. And that is an entirely different portion of our clinic and what I think our clinic uh, is so successful of, because um, that is a, a connection of the heart that can be made where there is instant uh, trust instant understanding and instant non-judgment from somebody who has been there. And so um, I want to turn it over to Gina to talk about her role as our parent ally. I'm honored to do this work with our parent allies. And I think um, having the voice of lived experience is so crucial and so critical as we think about where these systems have, have fallen short. So I'll turn it over to Gina. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Adam. Oh my goodness. It is such an honor to be here with all of you today. It's uh, taken me a lot to get here to this, to be in this space. Uh, you know, I come from an 11 year meth addiction 
And today I'm a woman in recovery with 14 years, five months and 28 days clean. I come from a place of 27 lived experience years in domestic violence relationships. And today I'm 13 years free of DV. And what I hold special to my heart is I once was a mother um, absent from all three of my children. And today I'm present in each and every one of their lives. I am a mother that, um, you know, found myself in a child welfare case for two years. And I was never able to actually speak my truth because I grew up um, saying everything's okay and hiding behind the smile. And so when I reached a point um, of having to ask for help, I really didn't know how. Um, I used um, during my second pregnancy um, up until three days before when he was born. And I remember going into the hospital in fear of, of what was going to happen and what the outcome was going to be. Um, I ended up in that child welfare system and that ended up in, after two years, I reached a place where it was no longer about me. It was about my son and relinquishing my rights so he could have the opportunities that I was unable to, to give him at that time. I was uh, pregnant for the third time, used during that pregnancy as well, kind of a pattern for me. And during that case, I was visited um, by a CPS social worker uh, and I was tired and I was ready. And I was, it was that little moment of a place of surrender and being able to be offered the services that I needed at that moment. And I ended up uh, going into a family voluntary case and going into treatment, scariest day of my life. Uh, and I never forget that moment. And then I came out and I was homeless and I had to navigate uh, community resources to help build who I am today. And who I am today and everything that I've been through has created me to be able to be a parent ally. And being a, a parent ally at the first legal clinic is literally uh, a dream come true. Like I get to be that mom that I had wished, prayed for, and didn't even know existed because it didn't back then for me. Um, and I get to meet these moms. And at the beginning of First Legal Clinic, I would meet the moms uh, in the hospital when they had just given birth at bedside. Um, and I would walk into these rooms and they would be so scared. Uh, scared that because they knew that their baby was going to be taken from them. They knew that they weren't going to be able to leave the hospital with their baby because they had never heard from where they came from where that happened. And so I walk in and I explain some of my experience, strength, and hope and offer them that resource that Adam was talking about earlier, offering them an assessment right at bedside. And then if, they're, if the assessment says that you need to go to a PPW program, would you be willing to leave here with your baby and go directly into that program? And these mothers would say, yes, yes. And uh, seeing a mom in that most vulnerable moment and see the glimpse of hope in their eye, there's nothing more um, empowering. And uh, Adam talked about those meetings and those family team decision-making meetings and how moms used to go in with just a little bit supports. I would um, get them the assessment, get the results, secure a bed for them to leave the hospital and enter into a PPW program and then offer them, you know, all the community supports that we have in our community, the parent child assistance program. We have a, a program called Homeward House, which is ongoing parent ally mentorship until a child's eight years old. Women in my recovery circle that would come and support these mothers in these meetings. And so creating supports for them that are their supports and they're creating the plan, which is building um, and empowering the mothers. Oftentimes there may be a lapse in between the, the bed date and when the mom and baby were gonna be discharged. So having to get creative and create safety plans and allow uh, mom and baby to still leave together. And one of my favorite uh, resources is a social worker that used to work for the department that no longer does. 
that will take one of our moms and babies from the hospital into her home for a few days until it's time to go to treatment. And so really building those community supports and staying connected to them is so important in the work that I do. Um, I think uh, moving on to creating all those uh, those plans and thinking really outside of the box in this in this work is um, you know we continue to show up and now we reached a point when we're going into those meetings and they're like what's the first clinic's plan instead of you know the the state and the CPS workers saying what their plan is they're asking us what our plan is. And that's because of how we work with these families and how we surround them with everything that they need for a successful outcome. As our program has grown, uh, more dreams come true. And, you know, Adam was talking about those screened out intakes. Sorry, I get emotional because I would have loved to have been one of those moms that received one of those calls calling them um, and when they actually answer the phone and say hello is my favorite. My favorite because I get to connect with them right then and there. I um, you know, say, hi, I'm Gina Wassemiller. I'm from the First Legal Clinic and I'm in this space right now calling you because of my own personal lived experience. And um, I'm here because somebody made a call uh, because there was concerns about some drug use and I'm here to help you, assist you, and walk this journey with you. And the most special piece to my work is that I get to work with an attorney. And so you'll have a, a free legal attorney that will be with you through this process as well. And if CPS should come, you won't be alone during that parent interview or a meeting that could happen. And so really working with these moms during their pregnancies and, and helping them get into their prenatal care. Uh, detox, MAP, parent-child assistant programs, uh, some housing, whatever they may be having issues with and working with them along the side during their pregnancy to hopefully have not, you know, don't have those um, issues when they go to give birth. Um, again, community, community, I can't do this on my own. Uh, and keeping those relationships and being in the middle of the boat in my community with the resources is so important right now with turnover and, and people leaving jobs and coming. And our work is so emergent and like right now that it's important that I continue to have those relationships. One of the specialist pieces um, to all of this is um, the mentoring piece for me and planting the seeds of hope in other mothers while doing this work and, and seeing those seeds grow and you know, you know, showing up for them and what they're wanting to do, and continuing to mentor them in their process, and you know, uh, getting a call from one mom, you know, I'm ready to go to school, and walking through that with her, and then when she gets to where she needs that internship, I'm still that person that she calls and reaches out to. So, you know, finding her that place of internship where I'm helping her grow, and um, like. Jennifer has been a dream come true for me because it was has just been me for so long. And, uh, you know, I'm protective over the work because I know what it's like to show up and, and have good outcomes. And so planting that seed in Jennifer and her seeing the seed and how it truly means to show up and being the same way that, that I show up. It's truly been an honor to mentor her and have her now doing this work and empowering other moms in her areas. And I would like to turn it over to my favorite, Jennifer Justice. Thank you, Gina. Oh, no, you, I was, wasn't prepared to start off crying. I knew I'd get there, but I didn't plan on starting off. Um, thank you. Um, well, as Gina said, um, I am a First Clinic graduate. Uh, this program means an incredible amount to me. I'm a mother of four. I'm a recovering heroin, fentanyl, and meth user. I've been clean for four years and 21 days. And um, I grew up in a family that was really large, full of love, full of support, uh, but full of addiction and codependency um, and a lack of stability. My parents were young. 
and um, addiction in my family didn't necessarily look like drugs. It was food, it was alcohol, it was gambling, it was domestic violence relationships. And so coping skills was not something that um, was in abundance in my family. And so um, I gave birth to two children um, in my early 20s. I was not an addict um, to those children. And I was pretty successful in my life. I had a nice home, vehicles, I owned a business. Uh, but eventually I became addicted to prescription medication, which led to my addiction to um, heroin. About three years into my addiction, I found myself pregnant in 2020, or I'm sorry, in two, uh, 2015. Um, exactly nine years ago, this last Saturday, I gave birth to um, my third son, and had him removed from my care while still in the hospital. I had a doctor whom I trusted very much. He was um, more than just my doctor. My mom worked for him. He was a friend. I confided in him. He knew everything about me. He delivered um, almost all of my children, my, all my nieces and nephew, all of my friend's children. Um, and he ended up being my mandated reporter. And it absolutely broke my heart. It um, made me feel alone. It made me, it increased my trust issues. And so uh, the day after my son was born, he walked into my hospital room and said, um, CPS is here and they need to have a conversation with you. And I was angry. I was um in pretty bad withdrawal. I had just had an emergency C-section the night before. I had not gotten clean during my pregnancy because I didn't know that there was ways to do that. Um, and so I refused to talk to CPS. I put it off and put it off. And then on day four, he walked back into my room and said, they're here. And if you don't do this interview with them, they're going to file in court. And so I was I asked my doctors to please not give me my next two doses of Dilaudid so that I was even able to get up and have this meeting. And I still had to be wheelchaired into the room. I was barely awake. And I remember only very small bits and pieces of the interview with CPS. But the one thing I do remember is that they told me that I was signing this plan to keep my baby safe. I had no idea what I was signing was a plan to, sorry, a plan to keep my baby safe from me. And what that meant was I was signing my rights over um, to the state of Washington so that my child could be placed with somebody else. A couple of days later, I ended up in an FTDM um, after I had been released from the hospital and in that family team decision meeting was my father the father of my older two children, by phone, the father of my baby um, and my best friend. And they went around the room. Well, first they explained their concerns. Um, and that was my son was born substance exposed. And then they went around the room and asked everybody where they want, where they thought my children should be uh, placed. And during this whole entire process, I, I'm listening and I, I'm I'm hearing about my baby, but I, I'm not even understanding that they mean all of my children. And so they go around the room and everybody unanimously tells them that I am this wonderful mom who just needs support um, and to not take my kids from me. After going around the room, they uh, informed me that the decision had been made to not just remove my baby from my care, but my older children too. And in that moment, um, the only thing I can describe it to that <laughs> may be kind of silly, but if anybody's seen Harry Potter, like when the Dementors come and they just suck all the happiness out of you, that was it for me. There was um, no hope. And I was lucky. I'm luckier than most that my dad um, said he would take all my children. He, um, even my baby, uh, he said, I, you know, they're not going to the state. They're going to come home with me. And so, um, I entered into a dependency, which lasted a couple of years. Um, and after about two years, we went into a termination trial. But during those two years, 
I had five, six social workers and just as many attorneys in that time. Uh, there was a time where I showed up with 52 pages um, of emails and phone calls and text messages where I was reaching out to so many different social workers and their supervisors trying to find out what was required of me, how I was going to do it, um, and even who my caseworker was. And, and in that moment, the judge looked at the CPS sitting to the table to my right and said, well, who is it? And they, their answer was that they weren't actually sure who my current caseworker was. And the judge told them that they were failing me. And, and even in all of that, um, during this time, I lost my home, my cars, uh, my belongings, um, my children. I lost my family because my family was told by CPS that if they did not protect my children from me, uh, they would remove from my parents and they would place in foster care. And so trying to do right by my children, um, CPS had put this huge wedge in any natural supports, um, any supports I had at all. And so after about two years, we ended up in a termination trial um, that lasted a very short time. I met my my uh, trial attorney uh, 22 minutes before I entered into trial. I remember being very angry that they couldn't remember um, the gender of my child, uh, let alone his name. And yet I was the person who was about to lose my rights. The only kindness that was showed to me during this experience was um, by the judge who ultimately terminated my rights. He was supposed to take the weekend to make the decision and he ended up taking two weeks. And his decision was handed down that although I loved my children, um, love just wasn't enough. Uh, and so uh, my rights were terminated and my parents ended up adopting my um, now nine-year-old. This led me into my addiction even further um, and my homelessness. And so this went on for another five years and I found myself pregnant again. And so this time I was going to do something different. And so as soon as I found out I was pregnant, I reached out and tried to get prenatal care um, and was unable to get it. I was given first appointments and then either was sent a letter, an email, or got a phone call saying that I would not be taken on as a patient because I was too far in my addiction, um, too far along in my pregnancy, and I needed to get stabilized on MAT treatment, um, medical, medically, medicated assistant treatment, uh, methadone, Suboxone, and Subutex um, before I would be taken on. And so I ended up in an ER, um, very uh, scared. I was having complications. I was having pains. And I found... Um, I found something unexpected. I found a nurse and a doctor who showed me uh, respect and kindness. And the doctor wrapped her arms around me and she said, no matter what, I'm going to be your doctor. And I felt like this giant weight lifted off me. Um, and she hands me her card and <laughs> my heart just sunk. And I reached inside my bag with all my belongings and I pulled out a letter from her office saying I, I couldn't be a patient there. And she said, I don't care. If I have to call you for my personal cell phone, I will schedule you. You will be my patient. And she not only took me on as a patient and showed me kindness, but she was um, educated in the supports that I would need and the services that I would need to get um, to gain sobriety. And so she connected me with the SART Clinic for Outpatient Services and um, introduced me to Swedish Ballard, a, a program, a 26-day inpatient program for women who are pregnant. And so I entered into the program. Um, and upon leaving, they gave me a card and they said, I don't know if they can help you. I don't think they serve your county, but um, they're new. Just give them a call. And it was the number to Adam Balut at the first clinic. And I remember thinking to myself, this is as good as gold. There is nothing more that I could hope for than an attorney prior to having CPS show up in my life. And so I got home. Um, I returned back to a um, house referred to as a trap house um, that I had been living in. And I called him and he instantly was kind to me. Um, from the very first minute, he was kind to me. He showed up in a place of no, no judgment he um, 
said, you know, yes, he was going to work with me. It didn't matter that I wasn't from Snohomish County and that I was going to be connected with a parent ally named Gina, who was going to help me find a path of, of, to success. And I remember as soon as he gave me the number, I was like, uh, there's that handoff and I'm going to call and no one's going to answer. And this is where this ends. Uh, but to my surprise, that's not what happened. Gina answered on the first call and she was sunshine, just this giant ray of sunshine and positive. And I was like, nobody's that happy. Um, and I thought, okay, here's some person who's going to try to tell me about my experiences that knows nothing. Um, and that's not what she was. She was somebody who spoke a language I spoke, um, had come from a background like I had, who understood me and understood what I needed to do to have a different outcome. So I um, moved to Snohomish County with some assistance, but I went to Snohomish County because she um, said she could help me best there. Um, and I just said yes. I said yes to everything because I needed a different outcome. And so my son was born 45 days later. And um, I had this wonderful plan that Gina and Adam had created with me. Gina had get, have connected me with um, not just outpatient services, but community support. She ended up finding a car to be donated to me. She got me into um, a motel that was stable. Um just really wrapped around community supports for me. And so here I am um, with a baby, new baby, really excited when I was told that CPS was going to be coming. Um, I knew that because um, Adam and Gina had told me what to expect and what was going to be asked of me. So I was prepared. That meeting still went as bad as humanly possible. My family came in and just were horrible. Adam was able to gain the meeting back control of the meeting. Um, I was be able to present my plan and CPS with the help of Gina and Adam gave me a chance. They gave me a chance through a safety plan to be able to parent my child. Fast forward, um, almost four years at the end of this month, he'll be four years old. My son has never spent, um, a day away from me. My, um, my oldest son who will be 20 soon, um, now lives with me again. And I have, a. a a very good relationship with my 17 year old and my nine year old who live just down the street. Um, I got a second chance at being a mother because of the first clinic and I'm forever grateful for that. I'm also forever grateful for the fact that now I get to um, be that support for another mom. I spent the day before um, last Friday, I got to hold the hand of a mother who was very scared um, while she gave birth in the room next to the room where I delivered my son nine years ago. And although it was very difficult for me, I was so filled with happiness that this mom was going to have a different outcome because of us, the way that I was given. And so, um, yeah, I'm very grateful to all of you and thank you all for allowing me to share my story. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, I love you <laughs> so much. Um, thank you all. I'm not gonna, uh, I'm gonna cut a lot of mine down so that we have time to go over our data, but um, this clinic and this um, experience has been the absolute highlight of my life. Um, I get emotional thinking about it and talking about it, not only because I get to work with such beautiful people um, that you all just heard from, but um, we're seeing true change um, because of what we're doing. Um, Neil touched briefly on those 72-hour hearings, those hearings that occur after a child has been removed. And for me, especially as um, I've been doing this work now for 15, 16 years, but as a young attorney and throughout my entire career, those hearings were the absolute worst for me. Um, you're meeting people uh, who are living in a nightmare, who during the absolute worst period of their lives. And, um, and, and like Neil mentioned, you have very, very little time to prepare and to gain trust and to, um, and to get to know these people. 
Um, and most of the time they're, they've had been dealing with crisis, whether or not that was substance use, domestic violence, um, being unhoused, mental health issues. And, um, and then, um, and then now they're dealing with this. They're dealing with CPS. Their children are gone. Um, they don't know where they are. Uh, and everything is very scary and very confusing. And none of that ever made sense to me. It doesn't make sense to take something and then completely destroy it. And that is what we do with families in our system. We destroy them to the point of almost being beyond repair, sometimes being beyond repair, and then we try to put them back together. And um, and that just does not make sense to me. It's never made sense to me. And so being able to do this work and work upstream um, so that we can keep families out of court, so that we can avoid this altogether. And that um, is what the clinic does. Um, we don't go to court. Uh, our goal is to keep families out of court, um, and so we will stay with a family um, in, until a court case is filed, in which case then we will um, we'll hand that over to to their oncoming attorney. But um, but that's the goal is to try to keep families out of the system. And what we're seeing is that it is working. Um, we've watched our the culture in Snohomish County, uh, which is where we are located. Um, we've watched it really shift and change over the last couple years. Um, we went from showing up at these meetings when we very first started and being told you can't be here um, to now getting calls from department social workers saying, where are you? This parent needs you. How can you help them? And um, and we've watched a, a shift on the bench and how the court receives these cases. And I think that one of the biggest reasons is because when you're working with the most vulnerable children, I mean, we serve families that um, that have newborns. And when you are seeing that these parents can care for these children safely and that these families can remain intact, then um, you start to get comfortable allowing a five-year-old stay in somebody's care, a nine-year-old. And, um, and so we've seen we've seen a lot of shift and changes just in the short time that we've been in existence. And um, and really, like Adam mentioned, none of this would be possible without the assistance of all of our partners and the connections that we made. And, um, and it is through these connections that uh, we're really trying to push for systemic change. We really want to change the system so that, um, so that we're doing things differently, so that we are not um, watching families be destroyed. And um, with that, I'm going to uh, allow Neil to get into our data to highlight a little bit of what we have done. We hit on mute and uh, we get set up with the data. So um, I guess just a, a couple of things. Neil, your screen is no longer being shared, just FYI. Oh. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll do that in one sec. Thank okay. you. So um, uh, we have data that's from 2022. Obviously, we have stuff from 2023, but that hasn't been processed to the point of us being able to include it. So uh, there's obviously newer stuff, but I wanted to, to say that. And I think for the most part, um, the trends that you'll see here that we're going to discuss are the same trends that we've seen in preliminary um, reviews of what our 2023 data is. So uh let me share that. And so uh, the first one, here we go. All right. So this just talked about our growth over the years. So obviously we said we started in 2019 um, and fiscal year is uh, the uh, state fiscal year. So that would be the July, it really should probably say 2019 to 2020 would be that first one. So 2019 to 2020, and then the 2020 to 2021. So that's the, the fiscal year ending there. So you can see um, our growth really increasing over time. Um, and in 2023, we were in the 300s for clients that fiscal year, um, if not close to 400. Um, and so uh, we've gotten many calls over the years. We've served, I think, around 700 different families with our program now. Um, I'd have to look at that specific number, but a big factor in us increasing was that first year uh, we didn't have any funding. And so we first got funding for 
um, uh, uh, administrative and technical support, but not for actually our operations. And so our first uh, few clients that we worked with, uh, we literally just started working them completely pro bono with no funding whatsoever, hoping that showing that this was successful would build the program out. Uh, next is the percentage of cases um, where uh, there's a known outcome, whether the dependency has been filed in cases where we know if there's the outcome, 82% of the cases that we work with, and this trend has stayed consistent through 2023, and the data we have now are filed, and uh, 18%, or sorry, are not filed, 18% are filed. Also worth noting, um, and I don't think we have this in the slides, consistently of the cases that have been filed, that 18%, a third of them don't have a removal. So either uh, we go into court and there's an agreement not for a removal or it's filed and there's no request for removal, but they just want the case, or we go to a contested 72 hour shelter care hearing um, and we win the removal uh, or not win the removal, but win the hearing and prevent removal. So even of those cases that um, do have a dependency filing, um, although we're working on getting uh, uh, more uh, a showing of this statistically, anecdotally, we, we believe that there's better outcomes even with the cases that are filed. Uh, next up, this has to do with race and ethnicity demographics for the children. Uh, again, that fiscal year 2020 is the 30 cases. It's a relatively small sample size and really limited to Snohomish County. Um, but uh, as you could see, the majority, especially going into the, the past years, I and mean, I guess there is the data through here for 2023, at least for the fiscal year, um, is that the majority of uh, cases that we're dealing with are children who are children of color. Um, and uh, uh, obviously 41 or 45% uh, white children for the past few fiscal years. Uh, this one we've talked about, um, and that's something that we've uh, measured was about the mothers with DCYF history when they were children. Um, and this is something that we keep track of about that cyclical involvement that Adam was talking about. And 31%, we have a, a yes or possibly, because um, some are like, I think I was, but I don't know, or you know, I think we were investigated. Uh, but about a third of the clients uh, that we work with uh, believe they either for sure or um, very likely had uh, history with DCYF or child welfare as minors themselves. So uh, part of trying to end that cyclical um, generational trauma that Adam was talking about. This one I think is really important. And uh, again, it goes into the fiscal year. We do have it through the fiscal year 2023, uh, which would be the one ending in uh, June of 2023. This is the length of stay that or length of that our cases are open. Notable is that when children are found dependent, LOS is length of stay. So when the court files a case, the state statistics are the ones from December of 2021. The median stay was 678 days. So children are in care an average of close to uh, around two years if the case files or if there's a removal and a case is filed. As a comparison, there's two categories we're looking at here, DCYF case and non-DCYF case. The very short version that I'm going to explain is a little bit more complicated than this, but it's clients that we work with while they're pregnant versus clients that we work with and start working with them after they've given birth. So if it's a no DCYF case, that's generally the clients that we work with after they've given birth. And you can see the average number of days and the grand total towards the end is 76 that we're working with them. So it makes sense that that's shorter because we're working with them for a shorter amount of time. But even the pregnant parents that we're working with, the average amount that we're working on their case is 108 days. So a total average of 89 days that our case is open with these clients and that's, again, with those statistics that oftentimes lead to no removal versus the 678 of children being in care in the state of Washington. Um, and uh, that's it in terms of statistics. So um, I will uh, give it back to Tyla if Tyla has any final comments. And then um, I don't know if there's any time for questions. Um, thank you, Neil. Um, I Before I do turn it over for questions, I just want to let people know that um, in most of the cases that we see that are filed on the child welfare cases that end up in court, um, parental substance use, regardless of whether it's tied to abuse or neglect, is not only a factor in, but it is usually 
central to the removal of those children. And in cases involving newborns at the hospital, it is typically the only reason for removal. And most of the parents that we see that lose their children to the system are not abusive. Um, they're not hopeless addicts. Um, these are people that lack support, connection, and love. And when we began to look at and understand addiction, um, whether it's to drugs or another form of behavior, as a lack of support, connection, and love, and we start to be the source of support, connection, and love, um, changes happen. And so uh, if I could leave you with anything, it is that. When you're doing your work, um, support, connection, and love is the way to go. Um, and with that, if anyone has questions. Thank you so much. Yeah, if you have questions, you can raise your hand or unmute yourself. Or Maureen, they can't unmute. So you need to raise your hand and then Maureen will unmute you. And while we're waiting for people to raise their hand, um, Gina and Jennifer, I just want to give you a heartfelt thank you for sharing an incredible um, life history and experience and how this program has impacted you. I, I think it's incredible that you're out there and you're, you're willing to share this very vulnerable part of your life with people. And I think that makes huge, huge impacts. And so thank you. Neil, Adam, and Talia, thank you so much for um, this really incredible presentation. And I hope this becomes in the water in every state and every country, because this is really what we need. And so thank you. Thank you for the inspiration to start this and to see the problem and find a really incredible solution. And so I think there's some questions coming through chat. If, uh, I don't know, Neil or Adam, are you, do you want me to read them or? Um, I'll cover a couple because I see a few that um, are kind of out there. One of the thing uh, was referrals. Adam just put our, our phone number in there. Um, if you have uh, our emails, um, uh, I know Tyler is a pretty good central resource for it if you want to reach out, but the phone number uh, should be good that Adam put in there. Uh, a lot of questions that we saw, what counties do we serve? I'm going to try to keep it as simple as possible because it's uh, unfortunately a little bit complex, so I can oversimplify it, but the simple version is, is that our clinic can help with pregnant parents that don't have an open dependency for older kids across the state. We could help with them. Specifically, our clinic, once a baby is born, can help with Snohomish and King County, but the Office of Public Defense, um, the funding's been expanded, and now there's programs in Yakima County, uh, Skagit, and Whatcom counties that are similar to ours that we're all working together, and they could represent uh, parents of newborns as well, but um, we should be able to help pregnant parents. Uh, there is some restrictions on that if they already have an open case with CPF with older children. And the sooner we get the referrals, the better. Um, if we can uh, engage with somebody early on in their pregnancy, really work with a family, our goal is that there's no systemic involvement at all. We do not want CPS walking into that room. And the more time we have with a family, the more likely that is to happen. Um, another big change, or not a big change, another question I've seen come up a few times is changes we've seen with 1227. And I think... Um, I'll let uh, Tyler and Adam give their perspective. Since I started, I'll, I kind of give mine. And I, the the short answer is it's all over the place. Um, one is we work with count or with families all over the state, and so something that we saw before twelve twenty seven that we've seen. Um, and I, sorry, Adam, I'm going to steal your term. Is uh, <laughs> go ahead, yeah, thank you. Is justice by geography, and so uh, a family that has an intake in King County versus a family that has an intake in Adams, Camp, uh, Adams County are completely different. Um, and the, the agency, even though it's DCYF, the same agency, the two offices are going to handle that completely different. And 1227 hasn't changed that at all. Um, at first in 1227, um, what we saw was, uh, again, very anecdotally, was a drop off in providing services at all. And it seemed to be that the tenor was, um, well, if we can't remove these kids because we can't show the um, necessary level of risk, and that's higher. I guess I should go back and explain. What 1227 did, several things, but one of the main things it did 
was change the standard of removal to what we uh, was called a serious threat of substantial harm to an eminent risk of physical harm, which I know has been controversial. But what's really important to note was the only thing that changed was the standard for all children is the standard that was applied in ICWA cases, children that are Indian child welfare case cases. That was the standard of removal. So this has already been a standard of removal in other um, certain cases for a long time. And we now applied that higher level to all children. Um, but uh, again, anecdotally, a, a big response seemed to be from the department and many of the offices. Well, if we can't remove these children, there's nothing we could do and we're not gonna do anything to help. It seems to have kind of shifted um, in terms of how that's being dealt with and, and kind of going back a little bit more towards business as usual of how it was with 1227 and those cases going to court and being able to be litigated in court. Um, but I think we're still early kind of in that process. But Tyla and Adam, any other thoughts on 1227? Um, not much other than what you said. I think there has been um, a uh, new legislation that will be going into effect in July that will provide a shift to um, 1227, the Keeping Families Together Act, that allows the department and the court um, to put great weight on the use of synthetic opioids, um, so fentanyl, and um, and. And so we don't know what that will mean um, in the future because it has not taken effect. But um, we can tell you that I, I would say now we are probably close to 100 percent of our clients um, are using fentanyl, whether they are intending to or not. But we are seeing it show up um, across the board. And so um, we our state is lacking significantly in um, beds for parents to go to with their children. Um, there are a lot of complications tied to uh, federal regulations of methadone and who can dose it and how. And, and so um, there are, uh, the future is um, going to be interesting, um, but uh, we are ready for it. And, um, and so, Bring it on. We'll see. Um, thank you. One, Adam, thing, know one thing that, yeah, one thing that's in the chat is just some ideas for kind of engaging programs or, or building this up or ideas for outreach. And um, there's really nothing that gets around just that initial one-to-one -one connection and contact. So we met with a lot of people that typically aren't invited to participate in the child welfare arena and realm. And I'll just give one example. Gina met with local churches. Churches don't get asked to do anything in child welfare. And so she met with them and said, what can you provide to these families? And um, that resulted in some um, temporary housing that that opened up there. But just uh, reaching out directly to providers, having that one-to-one -one connection. And then sometimes it's not going through Ooh. their systemic intake line. It's calling Pam. Or it's calling Deborah. It's calling you know, this specific person at this number, and that has made the difference for us. Because if you wait in line through these normal channels, if it's after 5 p.m., it's not going to get dealt with till Monday. But if you have a direct relationship with that supervisor, it says, if it comes in after hours, call this person at this number, and they'll take care of you. And that's how these um, real solid connections have been going. Tyler, I'm not sure if anyone's in charge of the, um, of the slideshow, but that idea of the silos that we had... Um, and the idea of changing the the way that we're operating now from this silos that don't talk to each other that are standalone to this idea of um, connections and bridges and channels and doorways and tunnels between these silos so that there's platforms where people can stand on in between the medicine, nursing, social work, doulas, and share. This is what, you know, this is the, these are the problems that we're having. And then somebody in the room can say, as a hospital administrator, oh, I can fix that by changing this policy, but they don't know to change it unless we bring it up as a as an issue that's affecting our clients. I was in charge of the slides, Adam, and I already closed them, so I'm sorry. That's okay. I, I wanted to pull it up, but it's closed. Sorry. Adam, Neil, Tyla, does somebody want to answer the question? If a pregnant person or a new parent has initiated services with First Legal Clinic, would a mandated reporter no longer be required to report, or is it that parent would be more likely to be closed at screening with CPS? So can't give legal advice when it comes to mandated reporting. That's usually um, up to the individual. Also, um, 
policy per where they're working. Um, and each employer seems to have very drastically different policy in terms of who is required to mandate report and on what. Um, but um, I mean, I, I usually when I'm talking to mandated reporters, if they are calling on pregnant people, um, people who do not yet have a child that's at risk for abuse or neglect, I will typically reach out to that reporter and tell them, not, the only thing that is happening right now is that this information is being logged to be used against this person when this child is born. Nobody is going out to help this mother. Um, nobody is going out to help this family and to see um, what they can do to get this person um, the services that they need. And so if you need to call somebody call me or maybe call um, call me with your client or whoever your patient whoever you're calling on um, call me with them if you you can call CPS but if you let your patient or client know that I want to help you and this is something that I am doing um, a service that I've heard about and that I'm um, I, I want you to get involved in um, then that really helps to preserve that relationship between a patient um, and a doctor or a provider or a client and um, their therapist or treatment provider and so, um, I'm not sure if that answered it, but. And I also want to recognize some work done by DCYF because something we've said a few times and it's uh, kind of true, mostly true, but also they're working on it is, is that when these are sent in and they're screened out for pregnant parents, that DCYF doesn't do anything with them. That's been true for a long time, but we work with DCYF and their prevention arm and they have projects that they're working on, including sending us those screened in intakes. So they are, um, working on that and there are programs where they're working on sending them, um, but they're not going out and investigating them, that's for sure. I have two quick questions and we have three minutes. One question <laughs> is, are you guys connected with the Safe Baby Court projects and or are you, and it didn't sound like you're in Pierce County at all. Just two quick questions. Um, For uh, Baby Court, so we have um, done a lot of work um, with the uh, Safe Baby Courts projects, um, zero to three, a lot of the um, organizations that support the Safe Baby Courts. Um, but our goal is to avoid court at all costs. And so, um, so there's not a great fit. However, if our parents are going to end up in court, then um, a therapeutic court where they could hopefully keep their child with them is something that we um, support. And then Pierce County, um, as of right now, we have the ability to serve Pierce County for people that are pregnant and not currently CPS involved. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, with that, we're nearing time um any last comments or questions and again just thank you thank you for this presentation and the work you're doing and i don't see anything else coming through um a lot of kudos and thank yous in the chat we appreciate you very much and the work that you do and um yeah we'll be in touch excellent thank you, thank you so much for having us